So you'll notice on the slide, Annette talked about that positive and negative tension, and hopefully the next panel will bring some of that to you guys. Um, Annie Pettit runs her own consultancy doing social marketing um, and education research. And she is the Canadian chair of the ISO uh, Market Research and Social Standards Committee and is going to bring her panel to the stage to talk to you about the relevancy today for associations. Are they useful? Are they not useful? What do you think? You guys have done a pretty poor job of conveying your value add to me. <laughs> I, I have a lot of things going on. I think we've heard that today uh, with automation and we're all so busy, and I, I don't really have a lot of time to join associations and go to your meetings. Okay, thanks a lot. I feel a lot better now. <laughs> if my panelists can uh, join me at the front and take what I am told are horribly uncomfortable seats, so pop up here. <laughs> all right, so just to get things started, um, give me a raise hand if you are a member of an association. Excellent. Now, I'm, t I'm talking about market research associations like Insights, the old CASRO, ESOMAR, ARF, MRIA. We're doing well. Okay. Um, raise your hand if you are on the board of one of these organizations. So we got a few hands, like three, four, and plus these folks up here. Um, now, I know some folks do not know who these organizations are or what they do. Um, you don't even know if there's a place for these associations. So that's um, something we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to give you one more chance um, to tell me whether you think associations are useful or useless. So if you think they're useful, let me see a hand. Our industry associations are useful. Oh, look at these two. Excellent. Okay, who thinks they are useless? Apart from you, Annie, nobody. There's like half hands here. I'm really nervous. We're trying to watch these people. <laughs> All Can't right. So, later. among our panelists, I would like to introduce someone who was unable to come today. But this is um, the Australian Association, and apparently, being on the other side of the planet is inconvenient for them. So we'll let them off with this. <laughs> If you could just uh, stand up when I call your name so people know who we're talking to. We've got Niels Schilward from ESOMAR. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Andrew Cannon from the Global Research Business Network. Thank you, Annie. Fabulous. Amy Savin from QRCA. Perfect. Simon Chadwick from Insights, which is the old um, MRA association. No. <laughs> No, it's a new association MRA. born out of the merger of CASRO and MRA. What he said. Yeah. And Mark Mickelson, which is, uh, who's looking at the Mo Mobile Market Research Association as well as the Social Media Research Association, and who knows what else. Just trying to keep somewhat busy, I guess. So as a bit of introduction from each of the associations, I would love to hear <laughs> from you what you would say are the one or two most important benefits that your association provides to whomever? I can start. Okay. Um, QRCA is the Qualitative Research Consultant Association, and our mission is to improve the quality of qualitative research around the, the world. I think that our, our benefit to our members is to give resources to uh, many of the independent qualitative researchers who don't have, who are not employed by enormous companies. And so it is a way to make sure that we are on the leading edge of everything. It's also uh, a, uh, gives us a lot of camaraderie because we travel a lot, very, most, many of us work in smaller organizations, and it's a way to stay connected, which is very important as we're looking for partners in other places. For, the, for our end clients, I think the, the most important thing is just increasing the quality of all of the qualitative work that they're getting through our members. Go ahead. Take on. <clears throat> Within the uh, platforms that we're currently managing, <clears throat> they're all very niche. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're all very niche oriented. There are specific things that 
different groups need that are very pertinent to their industry, be, be it mystery shopping, social media, or mobile. And those things really are, are subject matter expertise and connecting technology platforms with clients, with consultants, and academics is our goal so they can have a continuing exchange beyond the confines of a conference. So if I can introduce the Insights Association, I said it, it was born out of the merger of MRA, which was the professional association in the United States, and CASRA, which was the trade association. Uh, it is the largest association in the, in the US, and its purpose uh, is threefold. One, to protect and promote uh, research and analytics in uh, this country, and I'll come back to why protect is so important in a moment. The second is to provide education and cross-education capabilities and, and venues. Um, and the third is to enable socialization for researchers to get together and, and uh, analytics uh, professionals to get together and basically to, to form community, as you were saying. Um, but one of the most important things that we do is protect. Uh, and so just right now, for example, uh, we're actively involved in trying to get the California legislature to change um, a law that they're trying to pass, which would effectively outlaw uh, the incentivization of doctors, uh, which would end pharmaceutical research in California. Um, unless there are associations such as ours constantly monitoring and constantly intervening, we basically are, are in danger in many different areas because government is not necessarily aware of what we do and why it's important. So, you know, protect, promote, educate, socialize, and do so for the benefit of the industry as a whole. Uh, there are so many conferences, for example, these days that we all have to think about whether we go to or not. Half of those conferences are by for-profit organizations, and every one of those that actually uh, puts, you know, we go to, it takes money out of the industry. We, when we put on events, we put money back into the industry. That's how associations actually have relevance. If I may add, <clears throat> SMR. SMR is the global insights community. Um, it stands for elevating social opinion, marketing analytics, and research. So for people that still here. think that it's European, it's not here? global. So just wanted to, uh, mic? my mic on? No. All right, hope you heard what I said <laughs> anyway. So global insights community um, stands for elevating social opinion and uh, marketing analytics and research. If you join SMR, um, you will get three benefits, just like Simon. I have three as well. First of all, you'll distinguish yourself as a professional. You'll be uh, following certain rules, guidelines, ethics, standards. You'll get a quality label, and you'll meet. Um, you know, you'll you'll, you'll get um, you'll get a different position uh, out there. The second thing is you'll be able to network. We have a reach of over 35,000 professionals in the insights industry. Um, we have over 5,000 members in more than 130 countries, so that's a huge network uh, to benefit from. And the third thing is you'll advance yourself. The content that we provide in uh, different uh, forms of whether it's education or conferences or workshops are all vetted. They are not sales-based. They are not pay-to-play. Um, they are, you know, founded into, uh, again, elevating uh, uh, research. And I have to wholeheartedly agree with what Simon said about protecting. Um, I would say it's, it's, it's quote unquote fighting for our rights and actually make sure that what we do is not becoming downright illegal. I'm happy to share a little bit about the GDPR things that are coming up, but a lot of you may not realize that research amongst others may become illegal in Europe in the form that we know it. So we need to really make sure that we can keep on doing what we're doing, and therefore associations are hugely important. So I'm hoping that the hands that didn't go up are actually because, and that, that's, that's our uh, task, is that maybe we're not known enough, and that's not put into evidence enough, which is our bad, but I hope that changes after today's panel.
I think, Neil, so that's a nice segue into the GRBN, which is probably the least learned organization um, and association in this space, and that's fairly deliberate. Um, GRBN stands for the Global Research Business Network, and we distinguish ourselves in a number of ways. One is we're free. Um, there's no membership fee attached to being a GRBN member. The, um, the downside to that is you can't join it. Um, unless um, you are a member of a national association, like the Insights Association, who belongs to a regional federation, which in the Americas is ARIA, the Americas Research Industry Alliance. And we have four regional federations globally. So there's one in Europe, um, Ephemero, which for one of my sins, I'm also president um, of that regional federation. And we have one in Asia Pacific, one in the Americas I mentioned, covering Latin America and North America. And recently, last year, a newly formed regional federation in Africa, which is fantastic news to see the Africa research industry forming itself. So we have four regional federations, um, and they have approximately combined between 40 and 45 national association members globally. And they have approximately 3,500 businesses who belong to them. So it's a big network in that respect, but the primary function of the GRBN itself is to support national associations like Simon's, to help them share knowledge, to help them connect, to help them serve their members better. So that's really the primary function. The secondary function we have is to use this global leverage that we have through this 45 um, or more associations and federations globally to push out industry-wide initiatives. So we're working on a number of initiatives for the future of the industry. I'll just mention a couple at the moment. One you probably recognized yesterday talking about participant engagement and how that important that is for the future of the sector. And the other one we're going to be talking about um, in about an hour or so, which is the return on investment from Insights, which is another initiative that we see as critical for the future success of the industry. And the GRBN, through its network, can leverage that to disseminate these initiatives across the globe. Okay. So in my role as, uh, as part of the Standards Committee on the Canadian Association, the MRIA, I think about some of the things our association has done. Um, we've managed to keep market research companies off the do not call list. Um, so that's a benefit to a lot of people. Um, we've legitimized robocalls. Um, we've actually, well, I've gone to the government twice, talked in the parliament, trying to convince them to let the Market Research Association give us access or let us retain access to social media data and not make it illegal for us to access this data. Um, and, and like we've already heard, <clears throat> spoken to the government to, to try to convince them that incentives are not bribes. So a lot of money from the association is used on behalf of everybody in the industry, all of its members. And on top of that, all of the non-members who also benefit from the work we do um, with the government. So on that note, um, what do you folks think about all the freeloaders out there who are not members, but are happily doing the market research robocalls. Yeah, I've got something on that. Um, when it comes to changing laws, uh, you generally have to get a lobbying firm involved with that. It's not cheap. I've had to do it several states across the US um, for mystery shopping, for instance, uh, where they had uh, requirements to be a private investigator to do a mystery shop. We changed those laws in California, Texas, Illinois, um, and Washington uh, State. And each time, <clears throat> the contributions for change in the laws were paid in addition to the dues. So we had to do fundraising among members who had an interest in those areas. Whereas we really didn't want to have to take money from Europe or Asia, which was sort of growing regions at the time that we were going through those fights. So we leave that buck with the ones who are most affected, <clears throat> and they make the contribution. So I'll tell you a little story. Um, a, a company came to us uh, and said, um, you know, we are um, we're being sued as part of a class action lawsuit. 
um, uh, for under, uh, under the TCPA. Um, would you please come and um, would you have your legal people uh, help us in court and testify in court? And we said we'd be delighted, um, except you're not a member. Um, would you like to become a member? Oh, they said, we'll consider it. <laughs> well, you consider a way. Uh, and come and tell us when, you're, you're, you know, when you're, you've made your decision. The, and, it, and it sounds, you know, it sounds petulant in a way, and I, I think Needles is, is right when he says we have not done a good enough job promoting the benefits to the industry as a whole, and that's something that we constantly have to get better at. Um, but seriously, there are a lot of people who think that, um, you know, I don't need to join because you guys would do this anyway. Well, we can't do it unless we've got the funds to do it. And uh, as, uh, as Mark said, you know, uh, it costs a lot of money to actually do this sort of stuff. Just one other thing, if I may, Annie. Um, Niels is going to possibly talk a little bit about GDPR, uh, the data protection uh, regulations coming out of Europe. Uh, and many of you may go, well, why should we be interested in that? Um, particularly, you know, we've got the Trump administration now, they're not interested in data privacy. And we've actually been to the FCC, they told us, nah, we're not interested in data privacy. But uh, any one of you who does one project in Europe, you will be subject to GDPR. And that means that you have, by May next year, you will have to have on your staff a uh, chief privacy officer who may not be your CEO or CTO. And if you don't have one, you could be fined up to 4% of your revenue or $20 million, whichever is the greater. It's for that sort of reason to educate and to make sure that people don't get caught like dolphins in the tuna net um, that we exist. And if I may add to that, thanks mm. for um, pinning that. Everything that Simon says is true. I think if you're not a member, you should seriously consider becoming or joining one of the associations. On the GDPR, it's even more strict than what Simon says. He talks about a project. It's a data point. Whether it goes into Europe or comes out of Europe, whether you transfer a simple file, a data file, when you have a dashboard and, you know, whatever, you are falling under that GDPR. The whole notion of consent is, has to be, that's another part of the legislation, has to be much more into, you know, it's all about transparency. It has to be in people's face, not like a huge list of you know, terms and conditions that you somewhere agree to. No, you have to be very overt and have to explain it in layman terms so that a normal human being or somebody who's not, I'm not saying that when we're in research we're not normal, um, but somebody who does not know the technicalities of it understands it so that they know what they sign up for. Um, that's the reason why we have revised our code at SMR as well, to make sure that that's included into it. Um, another reason, by the way, is if we talk about social, any social media, there's no borders online, there's no borders in digital. Well, if it can be proven that a data point comes out of Europe and you're not complying, complying with the GDPR, you're screwed. And yes, 4% of your turnover. So you really have to, you know, you really, we really need your support if you are not joined, if you haven't joined, we really need your support to be able to fight for that. In January, I was at the European Commission an SMR summit that was organized with legislators of the Euro European Com uh, Commission in the room. They had no clue what research was about. I gave a basic presentation about what the value is of research and that it's not only about, it's not about selling products, that there was also good things about it. And at the end of the day, they came to us and they said, well, we're open to talk to the extent even that there's a potential that we're now trying to make sure that our code, if you abide to it, that it actually becomes law. So here is another reason for you to join if you want to be globally protected. That's another one. I'll add one to it, if I may. There is one big um, agency that I will not name, but look at the top five. It's one of them. 
they're not a member of SMR, no more. And they, <laughs> yeah, they had to, they had to, uh, they had to pitch for for a big client. Which, by the way, uh, many clients do say in their RFP process that you have to be a member and abide to the, you know, and subscribe the codes and 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 guidelines of SMR. If you're not doing that, if you're not joining that that so our association, you can't even bid. So they came to us and they said, um, would you, would you want to communicate that we are a member of the SMR family and that we do follow your guidelines? Just like Simon, we said, well, you're not a member. And we were so foolish to say, they said, we'll consider it. Mm -hmm. And we were so foolish and so nice to say, you know what, we'll support you. And the hope that they would join us. They haven't joined us. That contract is up probably in about a year and a half ago. I can tell you what the outcome is already. So, you know, we're there to help, basically. And help comes from both ways. So please join if you have a little bit unethical. And I'm kind of curious now which one of those top five companies Well, what is, is unethical? For me, for me it's, a, it's, it's, it's unethical, if you want. It, there, it wasn't a signed contract. It was a gentleman's agreement. Yeah. And that's one of the things you violate once in life. <laughs> so. But yes, for me personally, I would never have done that. That would hurt me. <laughs> oh, yes, it did. Yeah. I think, and it's a difficult question for us to answer in a way because, you know, obviously with our role being involved in associations, we passionately feel that there are tangible benefits to being an association member. Whatever the association is, we think that they do offer enough tangible benefits to be worth that membership fee. Um, but I think the, the argument around freeloading has to be around the intangible benefits. And to some degree, a moral obligation um, of people, of organizations, that if you are benefiting from something, that you do have a moral obligation to, to pay for it. So you know, if I'm being kind, I would say it's the equivalent of bumming a ride on the subway um, and letting other people pay for it is what you're doing if you're not a member of an association, but you benefit from the work they are doing on behalf of the industry. If I get a bit more nasty, I would say it's the equivalent of making a fake um, insurance claim and forcing, therefore, others to have to pay more for a service um, that you're also benefiting from. But they're footing the bill through increased premiums. So as Simon said, you know, this thing costs money. Those companies or individuals that are in the association have to pay per head, per firm, more than they would do if everybody was contributing. So in the same way as people making fake insurance claims um, are damaging and causing everybody else's premiums to be more expensive. And I even went as far as to think, well, it might even be like shoplifting. That, you know, if you're stealing stuff from a store, again, those who aren't stealing stuff from the store have to pay more for the goods that they are buying from that store to cover for that. So whilst I believe that there is definitely tangible benefits, I also believe as humans, we should consider the moral obligation of being an association member and of contributing to the good work, the really good work that all these associations it do. Sound, it almost sounds like you need a tax. On the yeah, well, well, you know, we don't have somebody going around collecting fines from people, do we, like on the bus? Um, so that's why people maybe pay it. But I, I think it's a moral obligation. I, th I believe in humanity enough to say that this is a group of decent people, and maybe we've done a bad job at selling well, the benefits. But if we do that, I believe they should understand also the moral obligation. On the intangible stuff, beyond, beyond legal um, battles we have to go through, beyond that, the, the, the basic currency of associations being networking, education, career development, those things are largely being replaced online through LinkedIn and other, other online sources. And I'm kind of curious, you know, beyond the benefit of, of political networking and so forth, what other intangible, intangible benefits do associations provide? Well, one of them, um, and Niels has referred to this, is um, a, if you like, a, a seal of good housekeeping. Um, uh, particularly in terms of certification. Um, so we provide individual certification and uh, ongoing continued education. Uh, but we also provide uh, ISO certification, which many companies now are demanding of their research partners. 
Um, so we, we actually provide that certification and the auditing and everything that goes along with that. That is a fairly substantial benefit. Um, I think the, uh, some of the, the events that we put on um, are very much more, you know, this event is very much about innovation. We put on events as well about innovations, uh, but we also put on events about the business management of research and how we can manage our businesses better. You know, there's, n there's nobody in the for-profit world that really gives a monkeys about that. Um, that's, you know, something that we, we provide. So I think there are, there are tons of these intangibles that we really do provide that, um, that, that aren't available elsewhere. We do, we do simil similar, sorry, we, we do similar uh, things, so I won't re re repeat that. I, I would say it's an invitation to everyone to come and join events of associations. One of the things that we do at SMR, SMR is around for 70 years, and we have built a artificial intelligent um, search platform, which is called ANA, and it's the collection of 75 years of all the papers, presentations, videos that are in that search engine. So if you remember, it smartly will provide you a collective wisdom, if you want, on any topic based on your behavior, based on what you put in. And that's another thing, just that this for me, we've been talking about you know, increasing your risk in terms of you have to join us because otherwise you're you know, under risk for legal stuff. But for me, that's one of the examples that goes you know, proactively reach out to you and say this is a unique thing. Um, and so that's one of the you know, tangible benefits that we're definitely working on. So I wanted to jump in and say, I think, because your, your question was about freeloading. Yes. And that's an important word. I think it's human nature to freeload. And so I don't think that not for everyone, but there's going to always be a group of people who freeload until we make the benefits of joining the association so compelling that the freeloaders are worse off uh, by not doing it, then we're not going to get them to pay us to be members. I do believe that it improves the way you practice if you belong to an association. I think that is one of the core fundamentals because of the education, because of the exposure to new things. It does make you better, but is it going to be better enough to motivate you to grow your business or change your business, or are you doing just fine without joining? So I think there's always going to be freeloaders. Well, let's see, if, let's see if we've actually achieved anything. Those of you who said you weren't members of associations, would you like to raise your hands again? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> wow. Don't be Amazing. afraid. <laughs> Unless. Go on, so on that note, um, <clears throat> we think about companies like IBM, Google, Facebook. Are any of those folks here? So of the folks that who are not here, <laughs> no members, um, how do we convince them to come to our events, join our associations, take advantage and support us financially in terms of all the great things that we do for them that they're currently freeloading with? That, that is uh, one of the biggest questions of the day, I think, for all of us. Um, at getting the client community, whether it be the Facebooks and the IBMs or whether it be the, the Cokes and the PNGs, to be involved and uh, to, to really immerse themselves in associations is unfortunately incredibly difficult. Um, and the usual thing that we hear is we don't have any budget. Um, <laughs> Google has of no Google budget. and Facebook? Yeah, you know, or any, any major <laughs> Fortune 500 company, that's the first thing that comes out of their mouth, we don't have any budget. But the, 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 it, so for us, it is actually really a priority to get m as many clients as involved as we possibly can. Um, because frankly, as I was saying in a previous session, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here today is actually predicated by client need. And if we understand in the associations what client needs are and what they're aiming for, then we can help them achieve that and help their suppliers achieve it as well. Andrew is desperate if, yeah, to get in if here. If I could take a different sort of tact and add to that, you know, thinking them as clients, but also thinking them as part of the industry yeah. as well, because they are doing research, whether they call it research or not. And 
I think all the associations globally are looking to expand the view of their definition um, away from just traditional survey based research or qualitative research to incorporate digital and all these other new techniques. One of the things, at least in Europe, that we're certain of that GDPR does not make that distinction of what industry they claim they are in. So if they are doing this type of work, they fall under the law in the same way as anybody else, and therefore the benefit that we can offer them through the different consulting services, through the different um, help with becoming compliant for the regulation, we believe that's the most compelling argument that we have at the moment to convince them to be part of it, the GDPR. Now, we're not techniques. We are understanding consumers and companies. People. People. Mm. Yes. Uh, the, they, they are coming, though. When I look at what ha what's happening at SMR, um, one of the papers that was nominated as a best paper um, in one of our conferences this year was from Twitter, a very foundational study on how people use Twitter and how it relates to culture. Um, last week, I was in Amsterdam. Client forum was uh, presided by somebody from Facebook. Um, we've had Google participate in our events. So they are coming. I would say we're, we're still dancing. Uh, we're not engaged yet. Um, but I'm hoping by doing that, by including them, I think that's what we need to do as associations, is not say, hey, you have to join us. No, we need to embrace, just like anyone else who's not a, a member, we need to embrace them, give them the stage, and then hopefully they'll be convinced by doing that. If they're not convinced, then either they really don't want to be with us or we've done a, a bad job at, at telling that's them what it is. you know that's we have value to offer but that's for me the the, the thing that i put forward that as president of smr i said we need to enlarge that footprint and we need to do it proactively we need to invite them on stage basically as definitions have changed yeah, as definition definitions have changed of what marketing research is i believe the research footprint itself has shrunk because of all the new departments and uses of data within these companies from data science to social, all around the, the all bend. And these millennials don't even want to be researchers. We don't talk about research alone anymore. We exactly. talk about insights, we talk about impact, we talk yeah. about basically understanding human beings. By the way, that's the, you know, big data, if you want, is just a stream of emotionless facts and numbers. Mm -hmm. Behind every click, behind every stream, there is a, a human being. And we need to understand why. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. Everybody says, yeah, research is a bad label. It is. Um, by the way, if you have a super duper sexy name that replaces it, please stand up and, and raise it. Okay, we're, I'm going to interrupt Insights here. Insights is a good one, but yeah. We have just a few minutes left, and I'm sure someone in the audience has some kind of question. There is a question right there. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anije. I flew all the way from Guyana, Welcome. which is located in South America, Welcome. not Africa. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm so happy that, so I came specifically, this is the only reason I'm here in America, specifically for this conference, three flights later. So my question is to the organizations, I just want to thank some of you because at the age of 19 I started the very first market research company in my country, Guyana. Uh, that's focused primarily mm -hmm. on market research, <laughs> business development, and insights. And, yeah. Congrats. <laughs> Th thank you. <laughs> yes, because there, I, I, f I remember as a teenager going on SMR and going on their website and seeing all these cool talks and, and reading these white papers about how important uh, I saw it as a link between the academic field and business development. So my question is, I'm currently in a country that we really don't prioritize market research. Technically, they don't really prioritize research across the board. Most researches, the only way they are commissioned are through funding agencies such as the UN or the Inter-American Development Bank because it's mandatory. But for countries where it's now developing, we've just moved from paper-based surveys to mobile <laughs> surveys. And I think that was something our team has been instrumental in promoting. We've been doing a lot of direct marketing to governments, telling them the importance of research and listening to people and the population and, and, and understanding what people really want. 
But my question to the association, the reason why I haven't joined any of you as yet, is because I'm placed with the task of promoting this, showing them the importance. And it's difficult, I won't lie. Uh, I'm young, we still have, we're still faced with the fact that I'm also a woman, and we're still dealing with all of these glass ceilings. So, do you guys, how can you help us? How can you help the Caribbean? How, how can you help institutions that want to advocate the importance of market research in these developing nations, I should say? I would say is Alex Garnica in the room? I think Alex would be perfectly placed to actually answer that question. Um, our, Alex is responsible for the um, America Research um, Alliance, and therefore in that role he's looking to develop um, a Caribbean Central America Association. So Alex, could you please comment on that? Yeah, what, what we're doing now is uh, try to create organizations uh, in the association side in different countries of, of, of South America and Latin America. And of course, the Caribbean is part of, of our effort. So I, I will address you afterwards and change cards. And of course, all the help you need, we can provide. I also would like to extend an invitation um, to talk. We can definitely help you. We have reps all over the world. Uh, we can provide you content. Um, and I'm happy to offer you um, a free entrance to um, either membership individually or join one of our conferences that is uh, local. So, by the way, I congratulate um, you on all your efforts. I think it deserves a lot of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Thank you. <laughs> you? Okay. One more question. There's a gentleman here. Very zappy looking gentleman. Hi, uh, I'm Christophe from Zafi. Um, <laughs> oh. I just realized yesterday that I'm still in the bracket of young people in the industry or uh, amongst most surveys still, so I'll represent that batch of the population in this industry. Um, we see a backlash, especially in the last elections, of young people rebelling against anything that's establishment or anything that's bureaucracy. We're putting associations on the stage. That sometimes can come across as very bureaucratic to us, very difficult, a threshold. So I'm wondering, how do you want to stay relevant? I've seen in my few years in the industry, especially SMR making real effort to engage with young researchers, making a passionate plea to make them representative in the membership. So I'd really like to hear that because if you want to grow, if you want to stay relevant, it's almost a case to make to the researchers of the future that it's not that bureaucratic. Yes, we need to do all that work to work with governments, so you need to run with them like they run. But how, do, how are you different towards those young to stay relevant? Thank you. Well, at SMR, you mentioned it, uh, Christophe, uh, we have the Young SMR Society, which is only for, for the younger people. And the way we define it is, is you know, 35 and below. Um, we have, <laughs> so you check that box. Um, it goes fast, by the way. You'll be old soon. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you from experience. I'm 36. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but, but I'm happy to say, for example, SMR has done these you know, numerous initiatives, um, uh, specific content uh, for, for, for young uh, job boards, um, you know, having people in program committees, have them present young awards to, to really have the world champion of you know, research, basically, or insights. Um, so, so that works, and I can tell you, I'm very happy to say that it pays off more than 20% of the SMR membership base is below 35. And the brackets of below 35, 35, 45, and, and, and 45, 55 are now in balance. That was not the case five years ago. So it does pay off, and I can tell you, the young people, and this is an invitation, if you have young people in your company, take them to these events. They will fully appreciate it. You'll get their, their commitment back, and they love it. I think I, that's I a, a QRCA also has a, a major effort, but being very correct about what QRC calls them, we don't call them the young professionals, we call them the new professionals. Because if you're new in the industry, no matter what your age, we embrace you. And they have been a vibrant and very important and growing part of our culture. But I will say that it's not all 
uh, all nice, when, you know, putting everybody together. There is certainly conflict in terms of the new professionals being more comfortable with social media, some of uh, experimenting, rapid prototyping, and so the, the new professionals are teaching the old professionals, and the old professionals are teaching the new professionals in a very wonderful way, um, but not conflict-free. I just, I'm, I'm um, going to interrupt here so rudely no. once again. We are very much at the end of our time, and I would like to thank the panel for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.